to our pre presenters today. It, they um, neglected to give me a uh, bio on, on themselves, so, you know, what do I do? It's my kid. <laughs> so, I'm going to give you the best I can do. Ariana Kalos is a graduate of Pratt University in New York. And she is getting ready to go to UVA this fall to study historic preservation. So we're very proud of her. We're looking forward to two years at UVA visiting. And John Elides, my son, is a senior at Randolph Bacon College studying business management. Ariana is the granddaughter of the first person that started this um, program, Mary Kalos. She had it for many years and gave it to my mother, Ann Robbins, and she was John's grandmother. So, welcome, Ariana and John. We're so glad to have you. Enjoy. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Got to get the headset on over there. Don't have this microphone. Thank you all for coming. It really means a lot to us. We um, have really enjoyed digging into the deep history of downtown Hopewell. How's the no. <laughs> Lucky? How, how am I doing? Good? Okay. Can y'all hear me? Okay, thank you. Shout out to Lucky. I feel like a newscaster slash flight attendant, and I don't dislike it. So, um, anyway. Thank y'all so much for being here. Thank you, Mrs. Elides. We did promise her for maybe about three months that we'd give her our bios. Um, so in true John and Ari fashion, that just didn't happen, but she did a lovely job regardless. So without further ado, we have downtown Hopewell from Wild West to Wonder City. All right, so we wanted to start off by noting a few of our references and doing this research we used a lot of different resources and talked to a lot of different folks, um, but two kind of important key resources that we found ourselves going back to were the newspaper archives at the library and the yearbook archives. They were really a wealth of information that provided us a lot of good insight into the history of downtown. So here's a, one of the earliest pictures that I have seen um, of downtown Hopewell. And you'll notice the smokestacks in the back and the wooden structures tightly built and close together. But Hopewell's history begins a very long time ago, but downtown's history begins in 1913 when plans were set by um, E.I. DuPont and Moors to purchase land from Richard Epps, who is a descendant of the Epps family of City Point. And as they were planning to begin building a small dynamite factory where the factories are located today. And that those plans were eventually scrapped as World War I broke out in Europe. And the demand for gun cotton was really high as the war raged on. And France and England were actually the two main countries that really had a high demand for the gun cotton. So they decided instead of building the dynamite factory, they built the largest gun cotton factory in the world, which which employed almost 28,000 uh, people in this small town of, of Oklahoma. So, and as overnight they built the factory and thousands of immigrants came from Greece, from Italy, from Poland, from Turkey, Armenia, Lebanon, there's, and even from West Virginia and North Carolina, and there's still a lot of people that came from those places as well. But they overnight, Hopewell became a boom town as the factory needed thousands of workers to keep it operational. 
And as John mentioned, there was this huge influx of immigrants from many different countries. And many of you, or some of you all might have seen this picture. I think it's a pretty interesting one. You'll see the sign in the background says, School for Coming Americans learn the American language. So here we have immigrants at an English language school and something really, really cool about this picture is both of our great grandfathers are in this photograph and not only are they in the picture, they are actually standing next to one another. And so these two guys, um, <laughs> do we look like them? Maybe, I don't know. Um, so my grandfather, uh, Emmanuel Harry Mitchell is on the left. And my grandfather, George Elides. Or great grandfather, sorry. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so pretty cool to see them together, and it was a great kind of feeling for the time and how many different folks were coming to the area to work out plans. So as all these men moved to Hopewell, they had to have somewhere to stay, to eat, to do all the things that they wanted to do. So this is where downtown sprung up. There were wooden structures everywhere. You can see the American Cafe, and all of these immigrants. They, you know, they loved America. All the ones that I've, my grandfather spoke of this, they were so proud to be American. They were so thankful to be in this country. And, but they also carried a deep love for their heritage. And as you can see here, there's an American flag and a Greek flag, and they're parading down the street. But it's very interesting to note that strong bond, they kept their heritage close in there, even as they're coming over as American. And so here we have another great view of that early downtown. We can see a lot of the original wooden structures. And if you look closely, it's a little bit grainy, but the bottom left corner says busy corner, Hopewell, Hopewell Virginia. Um, and so this gives us kind of an idea as to what this first downtown looked like. And notably, there was no police force at this time. There were no city government, really no laws. And so this sort of alludes to that first part of our title, the Wild West Side of Hopewell, and um, sort of the craziness that ensued in the early days. And it really was a lawless society at this time due to the lack of government and police force and drinking, gambling, and even prostitution were prevalent. And uh, it really does resemble kind of what you see in the Western movies. So here is West Railroad Avenue, and again, the uh, wooden structures, which would prove to not be really good in five months. You'll see it's July 15th, 1915, and five months later, Hopewell experienced its first, downtown Hopewell, rather, would experience its first major setback. We wanted to add this photo in, too, just because it does give nice context. Of course, we know the area was rural, but really seeing those pine trees in the background sets the scene. Um, and you'll notice as well, it does say Prince George Pool Parlor on that building to the left. And this is because Hopewell would be annexed in the next year from Prince George in 1916. So this is a, a earlier photograph from 1915. So here's another one we just wanted to share and let y'all soak in the really cool scenery. So we also wanted to include this. This is a really early advertisement, one it's hard to find from that long ago, the beginning of Hopewell. And it just, as you can see, just kind of portrays downtown Hopewell, the factories, and the Wild West appeal. For the Aldridge Clothing Company. This is the only ad you'll see from kind of this early era, um, but we'll be sure to touch on some more in the history of downtown later on. So we're gonna take you to December of 1915. On December 9th, a uh, large fire broke out in downtown and Hopewell, downtown Hopewell experienced its first made large setback that of its, its short history. So here we see a variety of different newspaper articles and as John mentioned, um, this fire did prove to be a major event and was national news. You might notice that these different clippings are from a variety of different newspapers across the country. So we have the Springfield Republican from Massachusetts, the News and Observer from Raleigh, North Carolina, the Houston Post, and even the New York Times covered the fire. And um, interestingly, there are tales of different ethnic groups blaming one another for the start of the fire. So it's said that the Greeks blamed the Italians, and the Italians blamed the Greeks, and so on and Definitely so forth. wasn't the Greeks, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this does give great context to the fact that this was huge news across the country and 
some interesting headlines here if you look closely. So here's one of those structures um, just burning up. You can see it didn't take long for the out exterior to burn off and just have the structure left. So we have another view here of the downtown engulfed in flames. Pretty amazing photos to have. Um, and John will tell you a little bit more about some of the rumors, tales that persisted in regards to the start of the fire and the kind of dialogue that happened afterwards. Yeah, so there was a lot of talk about you know who started it, and people, of course, blamed each other and pointed fingers. But one of the more conspiracy-like theories is that German spies were infiltrating gun cotton factories because we were providing gun cotton to their enemy that was fighting them in World War One. And so there's even a book; it's fictional, but it's um, the, the conspiracy theory is is a, it's a legit theory. As this is from the New York Times shortly after the fire. And so following the fire, here we have a postcard depicting the ruins. We're not exactly sure where these particular ruins might have been, but they certainly give a good idea as to the level of devastation that the fire inflicted on Hopewell. And because of this, much or all of the workers' housing was destroyed for the plant workers. And so you had workers moving into the city point in and some even relocating to Petersburg following the fire. So here's another picture. Sadly, after the fire, there was pretty bad weather and it rained a lot, a, a lot. And so the streets became flooded. And so, some sections of downtown you can only access on a rowboat. And so after getting sick of using rowboats, they decided to build a boardwalk uh, to get to this, this location, wherever it was. And the streets were so packed with, with clay that they had to actually bring in some dynamite and blast the street open so the water could drain from all the rain. And um, despite the kind of severity of the flooding, this is an interesting picture we'll get to in a second, downtown was, there was, there were efforts to rebuild downtown pretty immediately um, in areas with less but flooding, tents and shacks. Uh, served as sort of temporary stores before the real rebuilding could begin. Yeah, this is one of the crazier photos. It's hard to tell, but this is a horse. You can see it's shaped at two ears. There's a horse stuck in the mud, and it's pretty stuck. And there are rumors that I've heard, and I think this is actually a true story, is that this horse was actually left. If not this one, there was a horse that was left stuck in the mud because they couldn't pull it out, and they weren't going to go get a crane to to drag it out of the mud, so what they were left to do. So here we have another New York Times headline, and this is significant because it brings us to the Wonder City portion of Hopewell and how we transition from the lawless Wild West to the sort of Wonder City boom era. And you'll see the first line reads, Boom City plans to rebuild at once. And as I mentioned, there was that immediate effort to open temporary stores, um, and that was further facilitated by the National Guard coming and taking charge of law and order for, in the city. Yeah, so after the fire, the governor got involved because these things were not going well in Oakwell. So the governor got involved and made martial law, turned martial law on, and, or established martial law, rather. And as I already said, the National Guard came in, and the governor sent somebody in to establish law and order. A uh, man, I, I forget his name, but he came in and they got a police force, a city government. And this is really what Hope will have to happen in Hopewell's history. Otherwise, there's not, it's not sustainable. And thankfully, this, we're left with a real downtown because the governor sent more, the, the man in to establish law and order. And so the name The Wonder City was born out of the response to the fire and the speed with which um, Hopewell was reestablished and reinvented. Yeah, so here is, we're jumping forward a little bit. Here's a look down Broadway. You'll see the trolley in the middle, which is super neat. But you'll notice full buildings, buildings that can last, not wooden structures that are going to burn down. But this is what happened. Sadly, uh, not sadly because the war didn't end, but after World War I, DuPont closed the stores because there wasn't the demand for gun cotton. But two bees came in and employed 
lots of employees that once worked at, at DuPont and more people that came to Hopewell in search of work as two piece came. And it sort of allowed Hopewell to maintain its industrial identity and keep the population up despite DuPont leaving. So here's corn as mayor, you'll see the building on the left and the final product on the right. And this is a photo from the 1920s, early 1920s, so just five or so years after the fire. And again, we have another building in the early 1920s in progress versus on the right, the completed building. This is now what uh, we might know as the Burnett and Williams building, but it's probably best known for being the Southern Department store, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. And the courthouse, yeah, right. True. So here's one of my favorite pictures in color. You'll see Georgia's Drugstore, Dark Finkel Bros. And as many of you may recall, Touchdown Sundays, hopefully you were able to experience that as a kid. But for those who don't know, Touchdown Sundays were, depending on how many points the Blue Devils scored on Friday night the football game on Saturday, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Saturday, they were discounted to a certain price based on what they scored on Friday night. And this was at Georgia's Drug Store. Ice cream Sunday. Yeah. So a pretty cool tradition um, and speaks a little bit to the dynamic of the community at that time. So here, one of the, this is going even further down the road, but this is a view west on Broadway from the Chesterfield Hotel and Cornell's Manor, the one building we showed earlier. But it's kind of neat. This is the only shot we could find from the west. Looking, Looking the west. other direction. Yeah. And so here, opposite of what John just showed, we have Broadway looking east towards Sandy Point. And again, we'll see Georgia's drugstore on the right side. And um, I thought this picture, the right hand picture, was pretty interesting. This was an advertisement booth outside of Georgia's. And it's, it's fascinating to see sort of how these different businesses did advertise in this sort of collective grouping. Again, it was a good picture in terms of time. Yeah, so lots of parades happened in downtown as well. I'm sure y'all remember better than, than I do, of course, but there are lots of parades, the military, Boy Scout troops, and it just kind of this speaks to, you know, it was Wild West, and then after the war, after that period, many of the men that were in Hopewell working at the factory went home and brought home their wives, and they had families, and this is the byproduct of that, you know, a huge community full of civic pride, civic engagement, everybody's coming out to support these events, and that's kind of just the dynamic that uh, served Hopewell for a very long time. So, another parade, like, as, we, as I said earlier, the Boy Scouts, you'll see Rafi's billiards back there. I think they have a descendant of, of the Rafi back in the back. But. Shout out to George. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a building we'll see still standing in downtown. But this gives a good view, overview of um, Broadway and like John said, a lot of civic engagement, a lot of community pride and national pride. Pretty cool to see. And lastly, we just wanted to we have one more parade shot. These are great for showing um, the different buildings that were there. Another close-up of Garfinkel's. I love seeing the sort of mural-esque painted signs. You can see on the, the right-hand image is a close-up of the Garfinkel's facade. So we're going to do a little interactive uh, part. We've been digging through the Hopewell News archives and as well as the yearbooks, and we came across some slogans that we're hoping some of y'all can remember. Okay, so what we're gonna do is read out the slogan, the tagline for each business, and then we'll give you, for these first few, a multiple choice list of answers. So we'll read you through the whole list, and then um, once we've read them all, we'll go back through and ask you which one you think is correct. If you'll raise your hand, or if you feel so compelled to shout out the answer, that works too. Um, but first off, we have Hopewell's finest clothiers. So, your options are A. Harold's, B. Mark's Clothing Company, C. Garfinkel's, or D. Clark and Richards. Right, everybody who thinks it's A, may you raise your hand? B, C, 
or D? Hey. Hey. It's Clark and Pritchard. Clark and Pritchard. <laughs> Good job, y'all. Um, so here we have two advertisements. We had so much fun going through the ads. So They're more than we could ever look at, but I really a fun glimpse into history and bring you back in time. Okay, next. Southside Virginia's leading home furnishers. A, Hopewell Furniture Company. B, Butterworth Furniture. C, Home Furniture Company. Or D, Atkins Furniture. Everybody, if you think it's Hopewell Furniture, raise your hand. Butterworth Furniture. Home Furniture. And Atkins Furniture. Okay, majority Butter was works. correct again. Memory served you well, it's better words. <laughs> okay, this is the place where all the young men meet. <laughs> A, Rafe Billiards. B, James Bowling Alley. C, George's Drugstore. Everybody thinks it's Rafe Billiards, George's Drugstore. And James is bowling out. And it was Rachel. Join the crowd at Rachel's Billiards, the place where all the young men meet. <laughs> so, these next two are not multiple choice. Um, I think there are a few less possible answers here. So, if you do know who your friendly Ford dealer was, if you'll just let us know or raise your Shout hand. Shout it out. Shout it out. There you go. Uh -huh. Didn't even need options. You can still see these windows and the uh, early day. Great ads. And the shopping center. The shopping center. That's kind of hard. No? We, should, well, should we give a hint? Anybody, anybody ever? Water deal. What's that? Water deal. Mm -mm. We mentioned it earlier in the presentation. But we're testing your memories. What's that over there? Got it. it. Southern Department Store. Known for values. Anybody? That's it. Nice. Yay. 17 grand. Awesome. Well, thanks for amusing us. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, okay. This one. I got heavy. Your money's worth more at. That's a pro down there. <laughs> it's Woolworths. Woolworths. Yeah, your money's worth more at Woolworths. Now we just wanted to show y'all some of the other interesting ads we found. Like I mentioned, there are tons and tons, and it is really, really fun to look through the newspapers over the years, um, as well as the yearbooks. But we've got Rackley's Radio, a television company and the Hopewell Furniture Company, which you'll see more of later. Yeah, we have Minshew's Jewelers, Hopewell's Finest, and Little Chef Diner, which, which is super neat. I love, I used to love diner, not to Little Chef, but to Stones. Um, but do you tell about the building? Oh, well, yeah, y'all know it's an awesome building, original Valentine Diner. I know there are some folks who travel around and find them, so definitely an uh, architectural gym that we have. And um, now Roma. So here's some neat, neat uh, things I found. I wanted to include this one up here just to show, see the times. It's an extra special deal for college students. A special nine month subscription of Hopewell News. That would go to your college. Did anybody, ever, anybody get that? That's my college. And I have right. a Roman Coney Island restaurant in the top right, which belonged to my grandmother's family. And Saturday Sizzlers downtown, just, it always emphasized plenty of free parking. So. <laughs> anyway, a little selection. And the here are a few from, here are a few from uh, the yearbook as well. We love the style that they're in. Yeah, you'll see it. Nick Seclaris, that was my great-grandfather's godfather. Or no, my grandfather's godfather. And he owned the Quick Lunch. Um, the, which the Quick Lunch actually was originally started in, in the factory. And Globe Shoe Store, Chesterfield Restaurant, some neat, neat ads. So I just wanted to touch on Wednesday and Thursdays in downtown Hopewell. I'm sure a lot of you remember, but 
I've done some interviews and talked to some people that said that on Wednesdays, downtown would shut down a little bit early to prepare for Thursdays because Thursdays were payday at the factory. And so everybody would come downtown to spend their money and get what they needed. And you'll see all the businesses that are listed on here, and it's open till 8.30. You got to eat at Broadway Cafeteria and then shop. All right. There you go. So another kind of interesting tradition. Now we're talking about something a little bit uh, less exciting, but of equal importance. And I'll let John give you a little bit more background on this photo in a second. But um, from the 1950s to the 1970s, as some of you might remember, was a period uh, where a program known as Urban Renewal was prominent. And this was a program um, with the federal government where localities were promised money in exchange for enhancing their urban landscape. And a lot of times this enhancement really meant uh, torn down their historic buildings and that is certainly the case here in Hopewell. And urban renewal, especially in the 60s and 70s here, impacted the landscape and appearance of downtown in a way that we still see and feel today. And John can give you some context on this photo in relation to how, what we see here and how it would change with the rise of urban renewal. Right, so downtown Hopewell, it's still, I mean, everything's still considered downtown, but there are way more, many more buildings. You can see here, sorry I'm getting in the way, but this is Ashford Civic Plaza, across from the municipal building, and across from that to the right is where the, now the courthouse is, but these all have been just knocked down. Here's the AMP, and uh, this whole Main Street, really, Main Street, left side, closest to the quick lunch was all demolished and turned over renewal. So we really only have, if, if you're looking at urban renewal, you'll find a lot in the newspaper, a lot of back and forth between citizens and um, larger governments in terms of for or against urban renewal. But in terms of actual photographic evidence, we struggled in that it was something that didn't really seem to be captured. But we were fortunate to find one photo on the right showing um, some demolition and action, and that is actually the former Atkins Furniture Store being torn down. And then on the left, we have a little bit of a different view, but um, pre-urban renewal, what stood prior to the demolition. So yeah. certainly, packs a punch seeing them side by side. Yeah, and it's interesting too that the roads, they had to reconfigure the roads after they destroyed um, part of Broadway, where the courthouse is, as well as Main Street, or Route 10, the way Route 10 went through town. So an another neat photo here, if you look in the far right corner, you can just see the columns in front of Southern Department Store, what's now where Williams is, Broadway Barbershop. You can see the column, and also you can see the AMP, and there's a yellow cab sign, so apparently cabs are there. But Sadly, the whole left side of the image, that was demolished during urban renewal. And if you go forward past this stoplight, um, the Firestone, that's where Firestone is. We keep going. Is it also, does anybody here know Cynthia Ballard? I was just figuring maybe I'd throw it out there if someone would know. That auxiliary, uh, or that uh, is the BFW unit in uh, Petersburg. Okay. So she, She's probably Petersburg. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, just another colored photo of uh, Main Street. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful structures, but sadly, longer standing. And we did want to acknowledge some other lost buildings, buildings that weren't necessarily taken due to urban renewal, but are no longer standing. And I think um, certainly it's easy to start with Patrick Copeland, a real lost gym of Hopewell, a beautiful building, and as many of you know, it stood where uh, now sort of the where you, the hill above the river walk, and a great spot for hopefully some potential development. Yeah, maybe um, maybe the Francisco Atlantic project. We'll see. And again, here we have the AMP. Um, something you'll notice and these photographs is we lost buildings and found parking lots, for better or worse. Uh, here we have a parking lot, and to the left is uh, the ABC store for some context. 
So here we have another building. This was located across from Roy Hill Ford, I believe, and very, very, very awesome structure again. Um, not here anymore, sadly. But you can see, look around. It says Seaburling on the door, beside near the door. So it's kind of interesting. Tamina, the Swanson Aircraft Company built small uh, airplanes in that building. So the Swanson Aircraft Company built small airplanes in that building, which is really neat. Yeah, architecturally it's very interesting too. Maybe they were used at Jordan Ford Airport. And we gained another parking lot here across from our hill building. So, with that, to lighten your spirit, uh, we wanted to talk about what I've dubbed the real urban renewal, and that is what I think is happening now, and what's been happening really over the last decade, and a few uh, situations before that as well. And there's no but better place to start than with the Beacon Theater. On the left, we have a photo of the Beacon in the 1980s. Some of you all might remember the many different iterations this building has seen, originally the Broadway Theater back in the day, and certainly a cornerstone of downtown Hopewell. But we're fortunate that the Beacon did see a total restoration, both interior and exterior, in the last decade, and now is a beautiful operational music venue, and couldn't be a, a better preservation example. One other thing to note um, during urban renewal is the, the construction of Cavalry Square. That took a lot of business out of downtown and sent people to the shopping mall. And that was a sentiment, as you all know, of the whole country moving to shopping malls and shopping centers. But just part of the reason why down, you saw downtown's decline in the late 60s and 70s and continued on until more recently with these projects. So here we have um, another great uh, change the old Shepherd's Place, now the clothing place, and some offices on the side on Route 10, Route 10, on the corner of Route 10 and East Broadway. And Bobby's Antiques, um, they've done a great job. There are multiple storefronts there, including Prince George Driving School, and you know, 10, 12 years ago, that, and that's what you saw, so it looks about 100 times better. And here we have formerly the Rick's TV service building, now vacant, but I think this is a fantastic facade restoration. Beautiful, and while we don't have a picture of the original building, I'm going to go on a limb and say that certainly looks more like it than the photo on the left does. So, exciting to see. One of the oldest, I believe, um, operational businesses in downtown, Walker's Gym, just had, had a grant to paint the front and do all the, the cool bulldogs. Um, but just, you know, changes, positive change happening within the last few years in downtown. I think to jump off what John said, downtown Puffs is a great example of the power of paint. A fresh paint job, as well as new windows and a new door, really did wonders here. Um, and kind of an important reminder that small changes also can make a big difference. So here is my favorite building. My family has owned it for 100 years. My grandfather bought it back in 1915. And my dad now is the owner and doing some renovations, a lot of renovations actually, in um, pre preparation for uh, Artisan Alley, a business that my sister's gonna start where they sell artisans handcrafted items. So here's an old, old picture of the building. It's had tons of different businesses home furniture company, you can see a lot of Wonder City Shoe Company, James Billiards, James Bowling, and uh, as well as Spotless. Anybody remember who recalls that? Yeah. Uh, but you'll also, uh, the street lights are really neat there. And you can also notice the power lines running through downtown, which is would be crazy to see today. But the building has experienced a lot of businesses, including Poe's Auctioneers, most the one about 10 years ago and if you went that there you're real real hopeful because that's when downtown was not on its grind 
And so right next door we have the former E.H. Saunders Electric Building, which is now the Land Center for Arts. And again, a really great facade we have where we're seeing things return much more to their original state. And here we have the former Victorious Attics Antique Building. Again, excellent renovation. This is now home to Haley's Meadery and formerly Patty's Pub as well. And we're back with the Hopewell Furniture Company. I, well, I think this sign is cool and might have had a moment in, back in the day. It certainly by 2012 had seen better days. And so it's great to see the real structure underneath unveiled and the uh, exterior of gun cotton restored and also a full interior rehab of this space as well. So this has been definitely a key uh, restoration in downtown in the last 10 years. So we wanted to do some side-by-sides of older pictures and you can see the tra major transformation that these four buildings have taken. You know you have the old wall furniture and then Rackley's TV which is Lisa's cafe and now the old old E.H. Saunders which is now Lots of Lambs uh, and then my, my dad's building artisanally but huge transformation from, from this day up to now. The Butterworth Building, by the Butterworth Lofts, another example of you know, major renovations inside and on the exterior. And now it's full rent, rented to the full, as far as I know, and looks really good. And here we have an old picture, an original photo of the Butterworth Building. And you can see the Metropolitan Chain Stores on the bottom left. And we thought it would be worthwhile too to point out one more addition the Butterworth Building has seen. And uh, not even the last 10 years, but within the last year, there was a full scale mural painted on the outside of the building. And if one of those spaces looks familiar to you, then you are correct because uh, the girl on the left is me. So, oh, and there I am at the bottom for scale. So, yeah, truly humongous. <laughs> So this is Soba Yoga, another major transformation of a historic building in downtown as well. And our last comparison from the last 10 years is Saucy's Barbecue, an awesome building and an awesome transformation, formerly the Turner's Welding Building. They did a full rehab inside and out, and it's most definitely paid off in making this a really well utilized space. So I've been working from home and I've go to the Hopewell Library a lot and I noticed a quote on the wall that I really thought was perfect for Hopewell, obviously since they put it up on the murals of all the Hopewell pictures, but it's a society is defined not only by what it creates, but by what it refuses to destroy. And it's perfect for Hopewell. We've had in 19, we were built in 1914, in 1915, town, 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 most of the town burned down and, and after World War I ended, DuPont closed, workers left, and the town was once again very low, po low very, population was very low, and it was very difficult for any business to survive in downtown. And then moving on to later, you see urban renewal. There's buildings coming down, you know, it seems like it's downtown's done, and it's come back, it's come back again, and I think it speaks a lot to the character of the town and the people that live here. We, refuse to destroy what we love, and it's obvious by what's happening now. Certainly encapsulates the current situation and the sort of perseverance that business owners have and that the greater preservation community has as well. So I wanted to, we wanted to have a few minutes left at the end, and we want to hear your best memory or your most vivid memory in downtown Hopewell, but we have to ask that you keep it under one minute. We have to ask that. Like, you please follow that because we want to hear as many stories as possible um, in the next ten minutes. So, if you would are 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 happy with okay with sharing, we'd love to hear it. And then after that, we'll hopefully have a few minutes for any additional comments or questions as well. So, anyone would like to start? We'd love to hear from you. Um, my mom used to tell me, and I guess I guess it's true that Dr. Perry's office was over top of. 
And she said Dr. Perry delivered one. So I imagine Dr. Perry delivered a lot of her little babies. I was mother of my mother's fourth baby, the first one born in a hospital, and she cashed her war bonds to pay the hospital bill. And I'm like, Mom, it seems like to me you have a down pat by now. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Dr. Perry's office, I guess, was over top of the George Drugstore. Thank you. We talked about Thursday nights were always our best night of the week because we would come down, we would get a cab because we didn't have a car at that time. We would come down to the cab stand, we would go across the street to George's drugstore. We would go down to the Broadway cafeteria and eat the very best meat of ever, ever to this day. And then we would go across the street to the um, uh, the newsstand where my brother and I would get comic books and then we would shop for groceries and get can home. So Thursday night was the best. <laughs> <laughs> Any other stories? Nice. John. Nice. Nice. a job when I was 15 and all I did was clean the shelves until one day she promoted me to the catch register. Well going back to the factories and the Thursday, I didn't know about the Thursday, under the catch register was this big wooden drawer full of hundreds and fifties and twenties. I mean I was just like wow this is great. And she said and you now can start cashing the checks. And they did. The men would come and cash their checks, pay their bill, buy a box of chocolates and life was good. So I, I got to taste it on the, I think the tail end of the beat. <laughs> we had a secret thing going on. She was great. She was really good to me. A star employee, you might say? Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, wow. I can remember when on um, payday, when Mother got her a check, We'd go to George's drugstore, and she would cash her check, and I guess they must have been giving her ones and fives, and I thought she was the richest person in the world. <laughs> and then we'd go next door to Garfinkel's, and he'd open his big book, and mother would pay off her tab, and then she'd pick out a new dress, and I got to pick out a new dress, and we would do that every time. But I also remember that bakery, on the far end where we used to go, oh, Mama, find me a cookie. Speaking of the bakery, my grandmother worked in Petersburg at the at one of the uh, Brown and Williams tobacco couldn't, couldn't get it to come to my memory for a second. She would always leave Petersburg, come to Hopewell, go to the bakery and buy me three butter cookies. And she she wore a uniform, and in her uniform she was just beautiful. And she always had a little pocket, and on her pocket she always wore the, the most beautiful napkins and. I, Handkerchiefs, not napkins, handkerchiefs. Well, anyway, she would always come to the house, and whenever I would see her car pull up, I tore out of the house, down the front yard to meet my grandmother, and she would always play a little game with me about the butter cookies. I would answer certain questions, and then I would get the butter cookies. So I'm so glad we have that memory as well. All right, anybody else like to share? Okay, well, if it, if it's yeah, just two things. I'll try to keep it under a minute. But uh, on the uh, Dr. Perry, uh, he 
did all that. He was very popular. And I know at least one person, I think there are more, who he delivered. And they named the child, this was my finger, and his name was and is Seth Perry Townsend. So I thought that was pretty cool that they thought so much of the doctor. The second part of my 37 seconds left is <laughs> self-promotion for my program in two weeks. We talk about downtown and the hustle and bustle. We talked about Thursday nights, and that was the highlight. But on Friday nights, when it was football time, the time to go to Werner Field, downtown went from the hustle and bustle and you know little Brooklyn to shut down. Nobody was downtown. Everybody was at Werner Field. Uh, for the football game on Friday nights following the, the big time Thursday night. So we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. And thank you both. All right. Well, anybody have any, did you have any questions for either of us? Thank you for that. The real treat is hearing from you um, and hearing those stories. Well, if, if anybody has any questions, we're going to stay. We'll be here to chit chat. Oh, yes, sir. Well, yeah, there was growth in World War, from World War II as Fort Lee was built, but what we found was mostly, you know, the t specific time periods. You know, we couldn't get like the we didn't get a ton from the forties. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so I hope that.